My name is Polina Tienoskepa, and I'm the forum manager here at the Rift Valley Institute. The forum is a program of the Rift Valley Institute with uh, Henry Paul Foundation. And now we're joined uh, by the elephant for this uh, second phase of the series. This is a recap forum looking back at the elections that took place in 2020 in the region, uh, Uganda and Tanzania in particular, and looking forward to the elections that are upcoming in 2021 namely Ethiopia, Somalia, Somaliland. The series intends to provide a long-term view on the democratic development of the region by providing critical analysis and space for debate on the pertinent issues during this period. And we'll look at the impact of online activism and internet shutdowns, protests, securitization and militarization of the polls, the media's role, the participation of women, and ethnic conflicts and the legacy of election-related violence. Our moderator today is Patrick Gadara, who is a political commentator, illustrator. Uh, without further ado, Patrick. Um, uh, my name is Patrick Gadara. I am the chief curator at The Elephant, which is um, a platform basically for reimagining uh, uh, how Kenya works, how the region works, how Africa works. I'm, I'm really glad to be joined um, uh, in this session by Fatma Karume, uh, from Tanzania, um, uh, who is presently a non-practicing barrister um, uh, and was an advocate practicing in Tanzania for 20 years with an impeccable reputation. She was the president of the Law Society um, between 2018 and 2019, and during her tenure advocated for the independence of the bar, the judiciary, and the rule of law. She was recently disbarred in Tanzania mainland after challenging the uh, president's appointment of the attorney general in a constitutional case. Um, we are also joined by Adem uh, Abebe, um, uh, who supports uh, transitions to peace and democracy in politically complex and fragile contexts as part of the constitution building team of the international IDEA. He has uh, convened platforms for dialogue and advised high level constitution and decision makers at national and international levels, as well as trained civil society stakeholders in political transition processes. Um, uh, we also joined by Omar Mahmoud, who's a senior analyst for Somalia with the International Crisis Group and is an international consultant covering Boko Haram and the Lake Chad Basin. We'll be joined later on by Kalundi Serumaga, um, who's a writer, playwright, uh, social critic uh, based in Kampala, Uganda, and one of the major contributors um, uh, to The Elephant. I think perhaps we could start with you, Fatma, um, and you could tell us what you think uh, about what the elections that happened in Tanzania. Are they better elections than before? Has there been an improvement? Um, uh, and what is the scope for actually improving the electoral system there? Are there still challenges, by the way, going on? What's, 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 what's going on there? I think um, if we go back to the 2020 elections, uh, there were a travesty in Tanzania. We actually did not have elections. We had a system of appointments, to be quite frank with you. The National Electoral Commission ensured that they packed uh, everything in favor of the ruling party. And uh, as a result, we have a parliament which is 99% ruling party. Can you imagine? As you all know, um, our president passed away. We are now moving on to a new administration and we will see what comes out of that. But frankly speaking, I don't expect things to change too much because it's an institutional issue. It's a systemic problem. And it's, it's the system that needs to be uh, changed. Oh, thanks for that, Fatma. Kalundi, if you can hear me, um, perhaps you could uh, talk to us about what's happening in uh, Uganda. The usual things are happening. Um, with a lot more intensity and greater spread. There's widespread persecution of uh, alleged uh, supporters of, of the ruling party or of the losing party, that is Bobby White's National Unity Platform. What this gentleman has managed to do is poison all branches of the states. Um, Parliament was a long time ago poisoned to be bribed and then being physically beaten into adjusting the constitution to allow him to keep standing for various terms. Of course, he poisoned the executive by simply sitting there. And then he has poisoned the judiciary to the extent that um, an open fight can break out between judicial members on the bench. 
Um, as I say, after the swearing in, uh, when a debate takes place, um, there, there will then be possibly a bit more persecutions. The whole thing is to keep a, the whole idea is to keep a lid on the entire situation until they feel that it has run out of energy. And then we can all go back to normal, which is living with this kind of situation of poverty and lack of policy planning and so on and so forth. But my essential point is this, that none of these states were designed to be democratic, and we need to understand that. And I don't think that until we address, we don't need new governments in East Africa. We need new states, okay? And I, I think in, these are states that need to be sensitive to the various community representations. All right, thanks a lot for that. Kalundi has a nice um, uh, overview. Um, Adem, I give uh, just a short um, uh, overview of what's in Ethiopia. I think in, in, the, in the background of um, my colleagues from Tanzania and, and Uganda speaking about what happened um, and, and in me trying to think about what could happen, it, it's very difficult. Um, so it's, it's obviously they're very pessimistic uh, about it. <clears throat> and uh, I hope that Ethiopia will avoid at least uh, the, uh, the night, the possibility, the nightmarish possibility. Um, it's difficult in the sense that um, there, there is, a, as, as some of you may know, a, a security, a massive security problem, particularly in the north of the country, but broadly across the country. Uh, economically, um, it's, it's highly indebted, um, and the country is expected to pay about five billion dollars in the, in, the, in the coming months, and that obviously affects the, the way things happen. Um, and politically, it's extremely divided, uh, extremely divided, uh, particularly along ethnic lines, but also within ethnic groups. Um, and I think what, Ka what Kalundi said about uh, some of the points in terms of how we think as a community, and perhaps even killing that uh, so that we start thinking as individuals, um, we are not there yet. Um, and, and in fact, uh, often the problem in Ethiopia is, is drawn as, as a, a contradiction between two narratives. One that sees the individual essentially at the center of the political system, and another that sees groups, particularly ling ling linguistic groups, as, as the basis of, of the politi political organization. And we are coming into going to elections within this context of a division of, of ideas um, and an un unraveling security situation uh, and very, very difficult economic, condition, economic conditions. Um, and as you can imagine, the preparations are going on. Uh, candidates have been registered, uh, but unfortunately, the, the, uh, some of the main opposition parts, particularly in the biggest region of the country, in Oromia, have threatened. Essentially, they are going to boycott it. Um, and what that means is that the uh, credibility, competitiveness, fairness uh, of the elections, it, it has already been affected, right? The, the perceptions are already taking shape before things even happen. Um, so now the biggest fear, I, I don't think a lot of people consider the elections, um, I think it's going to be a good exercise, as currently said, people want to participate and all, but in terms of impact, in terms of actually uh, leading to a different kind of outcome, I have, I have a lot of doubts. And in fact, now the biggest challenge is about, uh, about holding peaceful elections. So if, if we manage to hold peaceful elections, um, I think that would be a massive achievement. Uh, forget its, its competitiveness. Uh, and, and forget its, its credi credibility. All right, um, uh, Omar, how does it look like um, uh, in Somalia? What do you think of, uh, does any of what you hear sound familiar when it comes to Somalia? Somalia is an interesting case because we, we don't have elections in the sort of traditional sense. These are really more indirect elections or, or really selections when it, when it comes down to it. You know, I think the, the starting point is to really realize that these elections in 2020, 2021, were supposed to be the first one person, one vote elections in Somalia since 1969. You know, you're, you're in, a, in a context where state institutions are still being rebuilt. And so it's been decades, you know, entire generations haven't gone through that electoral exercise. You know, unfortunately, that's not the case this time around. You know, there, there's a number of reasons for that, but I, I'd say lack of preparation for this really monumental task uh, you know, the preparation didn't really meet the, the task. And, and so rather we've defaulted back to indirect elections once again. And so what that means in the Somali context is actually a very small amount of people participate. And, and it's organized around the sub clan units, which choose electoral colleges that are supposed to be representative, which go on to choose 
members of parliament. So if in um, the 2017 elections, about 14,000 people participated, that's going to double this time. Um, and, and so that that's kind of, uh, you know, a bit of a, a different take in terms of where, where Somalia is. Unfortunately, right now, the process is stalled over the implementation of some of these electoral agreements between the political elites. Uh, it, it's gotten quite contested, and I think the level of distrust is actually higher than in the past. Yeah, um, if I may just ask about something that perhaps Somalia should rethink as an aspiration, that maybe there are other ways of having um, legitimate uh, uh, governments that essentially don't result from one man, one vote election. Yeah, it's an interesting question because the one thing that Somalia has done well is rotate that power at the top leadership. But I think you'd have to go back, if, for example, look at the 2017 election. You know, prior to the presidential vote, when, when you were looking at the voting for parliament, you were looking at the organization around these electoral colleges and whatnot. I mean, there, there was a lot of corruption. There was a lot of vote buying. Um, you know, it's hard to say really that represented any sort of legitimate process in itself. It was really representing the, the population uh, as well within that, you know. And, and so I think once it came to the parliament's election of the presidency, that was, you know, sort of the saving grace of that election in that it did show that you, you could have um, a parliament that, that votes against the incumbent and that that power is rotated peacefully and whatnot. Uh, but again, you know, was that really representative of, of the wider population? You know, there was a lot of support at the time when, when President Farmaja was elected, uh, but there was also a lot of money that went into that process and a lot of outside external influence uh, that ties into that as well. You know, especially when you have an indirect process that's so closed, you get a lot of undue influence, whether that's from candidates who see a way of, of influencing just a small amount of population to, to, to get themselves in the office from external actors, which see the same thing. You know, I mean, if you influence you put a little bit of money in the process and influence a few actors, you can get an ally in Mogadishu for the next, you know, four years or so. So, you know, I, I think that is the one thing Somalia has done well, and, it, and it's interesting to reflect on that and, and to maybe expand the system while still keeping at least that, that norm in, in process. But at the end of the day, I think it's hard to say that those, those cycles that we've seen were still that legitimate, that representative uh, of the wider population, um, you know, I, and given that they were still so closed. Um, I, I still think there's value to open that up, um, and, and you know maybe that doesn't necessarily have to be all of a sudden you go from a small process to, to one person one vote in, in one cycle. Maybe there's a phased approach to that, and then you kind of develop these uh, uh, norms as, as you go. Okay, um, I just remind everybody uh, who's listening that you can put your questions down um, uh, in the in the chat function. Um, uh, and we'll pick them up as the discussion goes along. Um, I don't want to miss out on the question that Kalundi had asked uh, Fatma. So perhaps you could, uh, Fatma, did you get it? No, I got it. I got it. Okay. I wrote it down. Thank <laughs> you. I'd like to be a little bit, to have a little bit of indiscipline like you did as well. Um, <laughs> and to agree with you entirely that none of these states, with your comment, that none of these states were designed to be democratic. You're absolutely 100% right. Particularly the states, when we look at um, the states that later joined the Commonwealth, which uh, were um, the result of uh, colonialism through the, uh, from, from, from uh, the United Kingdom, we have to understand that they were set up actually to ensure the continuation of the crown, the power of the crown over us in the form of uh, a, uh, uh, if you look at our constitutions, in the form of the crown being at the top, and then we had a prime minister, um, and the prime minister, the crown was represented by the governor who had immense power. And that was a continuation we were supposed to, we were supposed to go along that uh, track. Um, unfortunately, uh, or unfortunately, unfortun I don't know what, which one it is, our leaders cottoned on very quickly, uh, got rid of the crown and uh, encrowned themselves, basically, and they became monarchs through the concept. They, they told us that we were going to go into a republic and we got very, very excited. We would no longer have a monarch and they crowned themselves as presidents. And that's why we have in Tanzania what we call an imperial presidency. Now, 
You asked the question whether Federation of Zanzibar and Tanganyika would assist to form, to form uh, free and fair elections, Kalundi. It, it, it's not the structure. The structure of the union has its challenges. Um, there's no doubt about that. But the structure of the union is not the reason why Zanzibar doesn't have free and fair elections. It is really the structure of, of governance in Tanzania. And um, someone has asked um, about the deep state. And, and basically, the deep state is nothing more than um, the people with the guns and the power that want to continue the status quo and who do not truly believe in, in, in the will of the people and do not want to give power back to the people because somehow they have managed um, to subvert the will of the people and to retain power amongst a very small group, group of, of, of people. And this power is shared because after all, what is democracy? It is really the right of the people to appoint um, their own representatives to, 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 to run state institutions for and on their behalf. Um, if you take that away from the people, then what you've done is you have given that power to a very limited uh, group of people. And unfortunately, I find this is what's been happening in, in, in the majority of the countries in Africa. It's a small group of people who keep wanting to retain this power. And all elections are, are um, they use elections to legitimize um, their, their retention of power. And, and I do agree with um, Kalundi on this. Every election cycle is a crisis cycle. And the only reason it's a crisis cycle is because um, there are few people who want to um, dislodge the will of the people and who want to take over um, the, the power, state power, and to abuse state power in order to continue uh, to obtain and retain um, the state power in the hands of a few people. And it will result in voter apathy. Either we will have voter apathy or we will go into bigger and bigger uh, crisis cycles. For example, what happened in Kenya, there is blood loss. Unlike in, in, in Uganda and in, in Tanzania, what's been happening is that the state has been killing uh, voters and, and the people um, at some point that is, they, they're not, they're going to lose that control. Uh, and so something has to give. It, this cannot go on forever. For a long time, there was the idea that was pushed for, for lots of countries, especially after the end of the Cold War, that um, by changing constitutions that you're going to fix many of the problems that are there with both the state and with the elections. Um, is it your view, uh, given the Tanzanian experience, that this is something that is tenable, that something that can happen? It's all well and good to change the constitution, but if you don't have civic education on the constitution itself and the meaning of the constitution, and you don't have uh, the, the general public, the population buying into it and understanding it and, and demanding the adherence to the constitution, then um, you might as well not have a constitution. Um, and it, it, you can, I think you can create um, changes by, uh, through uh, constitutional amendments and particularly a, a very well thought out and strong constitution. But you need people to be aware of it. You need defenders of the constitution. Um, I don't know, Omar, if I may ask about um, the constitution and um, uh, Somalia, there has been a, a progress from when you had the transition of federal charter to the provision of constitution, um, ETC. How has that made, you think, the state more legitimate and its processes, its elections, uh, are more legitimate in the eyes of Somalians? So I think there's a lot of contradictions in the provisional constitution 
that do need to be finalized and do need to be addressed in order for that to be a bit more legitimate. Uh, but I think I'd piggyback on a, a little bit of what Fatima said, and there, there's two sort of factors beyond just creating you know, a great document on paper that I think you have to have in, in the Somali context and probably any context really for that to be uh, successful. You know, we shouldn't view the constitution itself just, just as a panacea. Uh, but you know, first of all, of course you need the institutions around it. Um, so right now there's no constitutional court in, in, in Somalia. So there's no way to regulate any of these disputes. Right now, the government says its mandate can continue based on the, the passage of some parliamentary legislation last fall. Well, the opposition says that parliamentary legislation violates the constitution. Okay, um, uh, Kalundi, you're going to say something for uh, uh, Brotinoma? Oh yes, I, I was, um, thank you. A country like Uganda literally needs about five people to run it at national management level. You just need the head of security, someone to resolve disputes, someone to count the money, someone to organize this production, and, and someone to train human labor. That is it. Everything else that has come subsequent to when Uganda was created in 1989 has been concessions to largely, I would say, in fact, middle class demands, or concessions to popular demands, which are then handed to the middle class. Because even democracy itself, I don't understand. I, I know for a fact that certain cultures, especially there in the Horn, there is a huge tradition of democracy, okay, um, at community level. I know in their farm, like, even young children have the right to speak in communal meetings. Why is it that when now you have this state structure, the culture is completely opposite uh, and, and cannot be changed to reflect actually the way a lot of the people are? I mean, the Romo people are electing new leaders or used to traditionally every eight years, actual elections, and they have an actual court system that is native as we do here in Uganda. That's the first point. So when you talk about the constitution, you have to understand it in that context that, in my view, the constitutions were not created or designed to solve a state problem in terms of creating greater accessibility. The, the Ugandan constitution is actually a watering hole to bring into the fold of the state as many political actors as possible, and then simply tranquilize them with jobs and appointments and, and, and big salaries and, and what have you. Because every single coup in Uganda from independence up to now, every single armed rebellion, every single political crisis has been led by the politically active middle class in Uganda. Once you say there is going to be an election, you actually trigger a crisis because everyone now has to start maneuvering to, shoot, to see how do I actually retain this power or how do I get the power of the other person. But none of those considerations are legal or constitutional ones. So the first victim of an election is the democratic process. The first victim of an election is the constitutional process. So I go back to my point, until we recognize that we still have communities with community concerns. Okay, um, Adam, if we may come to you, um, um, as you look at this issue of whether our states, including Ethiopia, are um, configured to provide and produce democracy and um, uh, elections. Um, perhaps you could also think about how the, whether the, the, um, the internet and the connection that it creates between peoples has any effect on this and whether it's changing this on uh, enabling people to tackle or even challenge um, uh, uh, the, the, the structures of coloniality that many of us um, uh, have been struggling against. Um, what do you think? So naturally, the, the way we communicate, the way we say the agenda has shifted. Um, there's no one center of gravity anymore um, in terms of setting the agenda, in, in terms of shaping people's thoughts. Um, and, 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 and the fact that you know, in the old days, uh, they, were, they were organized professional media that mediates, that distill information and control the narratives. That doesn't happen anymore. Uh, so any, anybody with proper internet and a computer can set the agenda uh, with, 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 the, with the required skills. So in, in, in that sense, um, particularly uh, around times of elections when, when the, you know, the attitude or the aptitude for, for participation, for engagement is, is significant, right? it has uh, serious implications. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the, what, what the, the idea that people are often looking for information that strengthens 
rather than ch challenge their thoughts, their ideas, means that <clears throat> our, our politics uh, has become even more complicated, it has become even more volatile. Uh, so parties are creations of democracy and not the other way around. Um, so the question is, how can we make them fit for purpose? Um, but I, I think at this stage uh, today, it's impossible, uh, but, you know, because our countries are, are large, uh, we're complex. Um, so you need, you need organizations that, um, that collate ideas, that bring people with similar conceptions together and then outline their pro policy ideas and then how, how they do. So we, we need them. I, I think we cannot do without them. How can we encourage political groups to organize along policy rather than along identity and, and other, um, other less, less significant issues? That's very difficult. Um, and of course, you know, the, the main challenge is um, our politics uh, are completely winner takes all, right? Uh, whoever wins comes to power and they get everything. Um, and then I think another thing is, you know, obviously we, we are always against incumbents, um, but I think we need to recognize incumbents sometimes as well. I mean, I don't think uh, incumbents are only self-interested. Um, all they want to do is, you know, uh, govern the country, uh, maybe what is, empty the country and all of that. I think we, we, we need to also, as a position, as a society, we need to recognize the legitimacy of some of the ideas that these people have. Omar. Do you think the rest of us have it wrong about how we approach our relationship and how we deal with um, our incumbency? I think one of the goals of the Fermatial Presidency was actually maybe to become more like some of these other contexts in which things are a bit more centralized within Mogadishu and within the federal government. And there's been some new tools and some new support um, that have come through during his tenure that, that have aided in, in, in that um, Pursuit, but but I still think you know what we're looking at right now is the central failure to completely centralize the Somali system. So um, I'm going to ask you, Fatima, do you think it is easier for women nowadays to get um, uh, uh, up to the uh, to, to have whatever positions of power um, than it was before? Okay, there has never been a president uh, of a female president in Southern Africa who has become president um, other than through the death of a man. Let me uh, answer, there's a question here which someone uh, has asked, would the system undermine the powers of new Tanzanian presidents? She's, so she's a woman Muslim and from Zanzibar. I think the system will not undermine her. Uh, it's the men who surround her she has to watch because they want the presidency in 2025, and they will do everything within their power to undermine her. To you, Omar, I think um, given the idea of Somalia as one of, I think it's been described as one of the only two countries in, in, in Africa that are assumed to be ethnically homogeneous. Yeah, I mean, it's quite an interesting juxtaposition because you do have you know, on, on the surface, you know, a, a very homogenous society in terms of ethnicity, in terms of language, in terms of religion um, and, and, and whatnot. Uh, but then at the same time, you do have a, a very pertinent clan system, um, especially that that's, you know, quite pertinent in politics these days. And, you know, that inherently, uh, you know, arises uh, or gives rise to, to sort of division and, and sort of, um, you know, viewing everything in a zero sum mindset. If you look at any of the uh, reconciliation agreements, that, that political agreements in, in various member states and whatnot, it's always a power sharing dynamic. It's about dividing up the spoils. And so I think that raises a wider question actually about the nature of the current Somali federal project um, in, in terms of how it's organized. You know, I think there's probably three identities you could look at in, in a Somali context if you wanted to organize uh, a system and, and, a, and a governance. And one is, you know, um, the, the um, religion, you know, Somalis are mostly Muslim, and, and, and so there's a common identity there. One is this idea of, of Somalia as an ethnicity. Uh, and then the third is within this clan system. Uh, I just wanted to ask Adem um, about this idea of ethnicity and structuring the state around it. That's what explicitly um, uh, Ethiopia has tried to do. Do you think it has worked out for Ethiopia? Is it a better, especially now in the context of the conflict that we have now um, uh, 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 in the North? 
Um, uh, it, it, it seems to me that where the rest of us have sort of um, uh, valorized the idea of forming concrete national identities that subsume the ethnic ones, that um, Ethiopia has gone the opposite way. Um, what do you think has been the, the lessons of experience from that? There, there are two theories around it. The first one is that we have not implemented it. So we have, as an idea, the constitutional uh, architect, it's there. Uh, but in reality, it was never implemented. Um, so uh, the supporters of the current system, what they say is that you cannot criticize a system that was perverted, right? We have not practiced it. Um, and the, those on the other side, are, on, the, on the other hand, say, well, you know, we have given it a try, uh, given it a try, and what we've done is is create essentially class of citizens. Um, you know, you have uh, the owners of a particular region, and everyone else is a guest. Uh, so you have to be nice uh, to, to essentially get the, the the benefits that the state offers. To to be to be very brief about it, um, it is a structure. Uh, that, is, that is somehow necessary. I think we, we understand, especially today, that there's a lot of ethnic consciousness uh, and, and that has to be given some kind of institutional political expression. Um, but the, the exact format, the exact uh, design of it is, is, is I think, where, 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 where the balance must be sought. That's one. And then secondly, I think often in, in Ethiopia, we, we tend to um, uh, present the disputes uh, as inter-ethnic, as between ethnic groups. Um, and and from, from my understanding, and I have written an article about it, is, is that what drives inter-ethnic conflict actually is intra-ethnic competition, particularly within the biggest groups. Uh, in, in Oromia, in Amhara, and, and a little bit also in, in, in Somalia region, there are strands of thought, uh, and the divisions, particularly in Oromia, are between those that accept Ethiopia uh, or the Ethiopian identity, and that's that those that seek to at least either don't recognize at all or seek to adjust it, right? And then that competition, obviously, with, with, within ethnic groups, then, then drives policies and the definition of other groups, right? Um, so what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to say is basically that uh, it's not always ethnic relations that define problems, it's inter-ethnic competition that then, ha that then leads to definitions of eth ethnic relations. And it's, it's important to take that into account. Okay, we're coming towards the tail end of this. Um, I think we have to wrap up in about two or three minutes. So, Omar, Fatma, you want to respond to what um, uh, uh, Adeb said? If we think democracy is just a battle between two elites or different factions within the elite uh, structures of our society, then um, we let women out of the equation, the poor, the underprivileged, and they just become um, uh, puppets that are used to gain this power, and very little thought is given to their lot. And so I would like to see an understanding of uh, 21st century democracy. Omar? Um, so in the Somali case, you know, that's probably you know, two ways, you know, one by, by getting a little bit beyond just such a narrow indirect electoral cycle, but continuing to expand that. And then two, you know, focusing kind of maybe on, on, on the bottom up dynamics. So maybe, you know, there can be elections at, at the district level or, you know, increasing governance and, and good governance at those levels that bring people into the system a little bit more. And, and hopefully maybe that can, that can bubble up instead of trying to push, you know, down. Um, so, so democracy is about people. Um, and, and democracy is about a level of respect, uh, not necessarily trust. Um, and, and often that starts with the elites. Um, and popular pressure, civil society pressure is critical in getting the elites to agree uh, to those terms. I, I wish we had more time uh, uh, to discuss this, but I really enjoyed uh, talking to all of you. And I think we learned quite a lot about um, uh, how democracy works in the region and some of the things that we might actually do to make things better. Thanks a lot, Omar, Adem, Fatma, and uh, Kalundi. So, hand it back to you, Pauline. Uh, but thank you very much again to our panelists, Fatma, Omar, Adem. Thank you so much, Patrick, Asante Nisana, and uh, have a good uh, afternoon. Until next time, thank you very much. <laughs>